good morning uh, on behalf of the students at the center of education innovation and action research at the tata institute of social sciences mumbai i extend a warm welcome to you all my name is poonam meet and i'm a research scholar at the center and i hope i'm audible ah <laughs> पैंडमिक हेज डिस्ट्रप्टेड द रिसर्च फ्लो एंड द पार्ट दैट हेज बीन अफेक्टेड द मोस्ट इज डेटा कलेक्शन बी इट ऑब्जर्वेशन नरेटिव इंक्वायरीज और इंटरव्यूज every method that requires face to face interaction stands impacted we know that technology has an important role to play in this situation but we also need to give due consideration to several issues ranging from data integrity and validity to simply figuring out ways to get our consent forms signed also important are ethical implications of collecting data online especially for vulnerable groups like children and last but not the least we need to think about negotiating the digital divide which makes access to technology difficult for different stakeholders sorry i forgot to switch on my video to talk about how we can continue research amid the restrictions and the uncertainties of the pandemic we have with us our distinguished panel who have so kindly agreed to join us for this much needed discussion I have with us our first panelist is Professor Archana Mandele, with the Center of Education, Innovation, and Action Research at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. We also have with us Professor Asim Prakash, who is currently the Chairperson for School for Public Policy and Governance at TIS, sorry, at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Hyderabad. I welcome Dr. Eric Klopfer. who is the director of the Scheller Teacher Education Program and the Education Arcade at MIT Boston Next allow me to introduce Professor Don Passi who is with the Department of Educational Research Lancaster University UK and I also welcome Professor Yusuf Syed who is director of the Center for International Teacher Education at the cape peninsula university of technology in south africa but i think he has joined us from uk i would now like to introduce our chair for this panel discussion professor padma sarangapani chairperson center for education innovation and action research at the tata institute of social sciences in mumbai i will request each panelist to make a brief presentation of around 10 minutes around the themes that have been outlined and after that we can take some questions from students i request that all the students to ask their questions during the q and a but if you have questions for the panelists please type them in the chat box we will make sure we will get them across to them thank you so much and over to you professor padma uh, thank you punam it's this is the second initiative of the doctoral research students uh, both mphil and phd students of the center the first was a very successful workshop in which you explored aspects of communication and your own interest as a research community group and this second initiative is uh, very welcome and i'm really glad that you've all taken the initiative to get this discussion going even while many of us as faculty were coping with and figuring out how to get into the get our pedagogy to work online uh, i think the issues that you all of you have been facing and thinking about uh, because you are you need to carry get on with your research and make it work in under these conditions uh, this initiative is very welcome um, the the panel that we have as poonam has introduced are all people uh, apart from archana is of course part of the center Uh, have worked with us so thank you very much don eric and yusuf for agreeing to be a part of this we thought that it would be useful to draw upon your experiences 
broadly in the social sciences and most specifically to do with researching education and have you share with us um, ideas that you have experiences that you've had using working in um, on research problems trying to use technology make it work and your own very critical reflections on what works what doesn't work and how uh, the current situation in vr should actually lead us to perhaps um, recognizing constraints on what is researchable but also perhaps uh, shaping traditional research problems uh, to make them workable under the sp specific circumstances uh, the students in our center are researching a range of topics in education and broadly the social sciences it concerns learning experiences in the classroom uh, in the home in the school so in research on institutions research on teachers children children's thinking um, and using a variety of methods qualitative most most often qualitative ranging from ethnography to various kinds of interviews and occasionally also quantitative so um as Poonam indicated, it will be great if you, each of you spends about 10 minutes uh, to share your initial thoughts. And then uh, we can have the questions and then I will try to moderate and um, hopefully have a little bit more conversation once uh, our audience has heard from us. Uh, this particular webinar has been thrown open to all the students of the Institute, uh, broadly social science researchers, and I'm looking forward to uh, how your reflections will help all of us uh, think through this specific uh, context in which we find ourselves. So I'm going to invite uh, Eric to go ahead first. I'm going to, uh, so this is the order. I'm going to call er upon Eric and then Archana, Don, then Naseem, and then Yusuf. So Eric, would you like to go ahead? Well, I'm just going to share slides here. Okay, um, so thank you, thank you for having me. Um, uh, I will say that one thing that um, that the pandemic has done is sort of made sort of these remote meetings uh, a lot easier and more commonplace, and um, and it allows uh, I think a lot of international exchange and distance exchange that I think we didn't always consider before, and so um, I think that might sort of open up new collaborations, hopefully when when things improve in the near future. Um, a little bit about me, so you know the context I'm coming from in terms of my um, my remarks about uh, how we think about research. So I'm a professor at MIT, um, where I do research in education, mostly in pre-college education, um, focusing on educational technology, games, um, and computation. Do a lot of work in STEM learning. I'm, I'm also head of the Department of Comparative Media Studies and Writing, which is where uh, everything from films to games to science writing and creative writing go on. So there's a lot of other sort of Sociology, anthropology that go on in my department. Um, I'm going to respond to the, sort of some of the, the prompts here. Um, thinking about this scenario where how we think about researching um, children, how they might use metaphors to require intimate, nuanced interactions. So this is kind of research that we think about, you know, deeply um, qualitative, you know, one-on-one -on -one kind of research. Um, and and as I think about that question, um, I think about uh, you know what and how we're doing research. So um, there's, there's, you can go online and find lots of different sort of references to technology and its limitations at various points in time. Um, this is one uh, that the telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. So we think about um, the, the, the technology as it exists in some way, as it's been traditionally used. Um, and we don't think about necessarily where it's going or about other ways we might be able to use that technology, perhaps to, to do different things than we did before. Um, and so in sort of thinking about how technology can play a role in structuring our, our research and facilitating it and what its limitations are, when you think about the, the specifics of the technology, you know, are we using the right technologies? Can we, can we shifting? Can we be moving them forward? Um, and also the current habits that we have around that. So, so oftentimes people react in certain ways. So if I'm on camera um, on a computer, I might be reacting in some different way than if um, someone was just directly observing me. We need to be able to account for that, but we also need to be able to think about how that might shift. You know, so for for a new generation, maybe sort of being on camera is less uncomfortable than someone who who grew up without that. Um, and as I think as a reference point, um, uh, you know, this is this is what online learning looked like, uh, or we thought it would look like uh, a number of years ago. We thought that people would be sort of in virtual lecture halls, 
sitting down and looking at big screens, sort of recreating that that space. Um, and instead, it looks like, well, you know what it looks like because you're looking at it right now. Um, it's It looks like, you know, we have cameras, we have different ways of presenting this information. Um, it's it, it's it's uh, fundamentally broke the paradigm of the way the lecture hall looks. We sort of recreate that feeling in different kinds of ways with other kinds of technologies. And we need to be able to think about the same kinds of things in research. How do we use technologies, perhaps not in the same way to replicate what we were doing before, but to do new kinds of things? Um, so, so what are the affordances as we as we think about new techniques? Um, certainly, there's massive data streams. So, as we think about um, what we might lose in terms of being able to um, uh, work one on one with somebody, we gain in being able to have people have traces of what they do online. And I'll get back to this um, later on in terms of how we think about that. But, um, but the idea that we might sort of structure things so that we're collecting data that give us information about what people are doing and thinking um, can be very effective. Um, we also have to think about what are we interested in researching? So, um, you know, a, as we move more online and we might be thinking more about the technologies themselves and the way they facilitate learning, the way they might inhibit learning. Um, so we can be thinking about that kind of research, but it might mean that we sort of make some shifts in our research questions um, and research foci um, as we uh, as we have both strengths and weaknesses of the tools that are available to us. Um, in this current um, time, Professor Eric, sorry to interrupt you. Would it be possible to make your screen full screen? Um, I, is this better? Uh, yes. We just had a question in the chat, but, so thank you so much. Yeah. Is that better now? Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, I, yes, I thank you. Yeah. Um, so risks and ethical considerations of working with children, I'm combining this with data, integrity, and validity. Um, so, in many ways, the risks that we face um, in doing online research are parallel to the kinds of risks we face in face-to-face -face research. Oftentimes, when we do face-to-face -face research, we're storing data. Um, so, um, we don't sort of keep everything just simply on notepads in many cases. We collect digital um, video. We, um, uh, you know, we scan things or take digital notes. Um, we have students filling out things that are ultimately stored in some digital way. So even if they're not doing it directly, we're storing things, uh, a lot of st student records um, online, and we need to have the same kinds of considerations when things are, are completely online. Um, transparency is, is really important. Um, so transparency to the student, transparency perhaps to the student's parent who might be signing off on research. Um, it needs to be very clear about where data lives, um, who's gonna use it and for what purposes it's going to serve. Um, in many cases, people are wary as they should be about um, commercial uses of the data or security of the data, and and all that should just be very transparent to the people who are providing that data. Um, and that that relates to data security and privacy, which we need to make sure is is paramount in both again in both situations when we're doing things in person and online. Um, we also need to have education about data usage and privacy. For many people, um, uh, it isn't clear what that means. So we can tell them what it means, but they don't really necessarily know what that means. So we need to be able to provide ways of, of, of having students who might be uh, interacting with uh, systems as well as their parents understand um, what it means to have data that's private, what it, where, what it means so that it will be used in particular kinds of ways. Um, a really important thing, I think, is targeted data collection. Um, as we make the move to online learning um, and online research, um, there's sort of a tendency to say, well, we're just going to collect everything. We're going to collect every keystroke. We're going to collect every word. We're going to collect every piece of video that's collected, and we're going to use keep all of that. Um, and I think it's much more important to be targeted in the data that you're collecting. So, um, uh, you know, if we're if we're doing things where students are interacting online, maybe I only store their final results. Maybe I only store some intermediate result. Um, maybe I only store things I have specific hypotheses about. Like if I think that a student is going to make a particular kind of mistake, and um, I want to collect data on that instead of collecting everything. I think that's really important to be able to. Uh, both for research purposes to not just sort of um, have massive data that you just try to find patterns in, but have specific hypotheses about, and it also helps in um, in in the data uh, in the data usage and privacy, and um, when you're only collecting particular things. Um, and finally, common formats and standards. Um, as we as more of us do work online, um, and we can use each other's data and learn from each other, and um, we really need to be thinking about ways that we can have common formats and standards that we can use to share data.
Um, the, uh, last thing, uh, digital divide. Um, obviously, um, this is a, a big issue. We are not getting access to the, uh, and, and we are not getting access to equal numbers of people in different kinds of communities and different people in different communities are not getting equal access to, to, um, to educational experiences. And so we need to be able to think about what this is going to mean. Um, uh, uh, okay. Um, so maybe someone had some comment here. Um, uh, uh, think about representation and research. So when we do research, we need to think about who's who's participating in our research and make sure that we represent that research appropriately. So if our research only involves a certain population, we need to make sure that we represent that research as only involving that particular population. Um, and we need to do better to be able to bridge that so that it isn't just a strip of limited population. Uh, we need to design for the most cost effective technologies in many cases. Um, that's, uh, that's phones that people have access to. So we need to not just sort of shrink things down to phone size, but think about ways that we can actually use things like phones um, to, do, uh, to do education outreach and research. The final thing I'll, I'll talk about here oops, is um, a couple of quick examples um, and, and how we might sort of think about things in different ways. So obviously there's the Click collaboration that we were a part of along with many of the folks at, uh, at TIS. Um, and uh, part of that was about thinking about how we collect data, share data across teams, states, and nations. So we had to think about data privacy. We had to think about different laws. We had to think about different um, practices. Um, and I think that was a really good example of ways that we were able to do that effectively. Oftentimes, it took time to figure out the ways to do that effectively. Um, but I think it was a really successful collaboration. And, and, and that data sharing was a really important part of that. And that's something that we should be looking forward to. Um, and the last thing I'll say is we, this is just a couple projects we have going on right now. We have one that's um, an app we're developing um, for early literacy coaching where parents work with their kids on literacy. And we're doing another project, totally different project, where we're teaching middle school kids about um, artificial intelligence. Um, the early literacy coaching sort of involves a lot of intense work where we're sort of watching parents and watching kids work together. Um, and being able to record that and and have that be sort of authentic is just not going to happen. Um, and so that in that project, we're thinking about ways that we can just simply collect some simple data within the app um, that allows us to get some information about what's going on. It's going to be a much more sparse piece of par, pieces of data than we'd be getting if we were there in person. But it keeps our project moving forward, even if at a much slower pace. Um, in the case of our AI education project, um, it was going to involve us working with teachers who work with students in person. Instead, a lot of that is going to be happening entirely online. Um, in that case, we're able to collect a lot of data from the platforms that they're using. And so, in fact, I think in this case, we'll get more data, more information, more insights than we would before if they were doing it in person and we couldn't be there all the time. So I think about those projects in, in much different kinds of ways. We need to think about where we focus our energy in the coming months and hopefully not more, much more than that to be able to uh, target the kinds of research that we think um, will sort of yield the best results. With that, I will say yeah. thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Eric. That is, yeah, quite. Uh, I think you've quite covered all the kinds of issues that Punam had flagged uh, would be of interest. So thank you very much. Asim, can we go with you next? Arjuna, then shall we get going with you? I I don't know what the problem might be that Asim is experiencing. Oh, I think Asim is getting. I think we'll ask Arjuna to go next while Asim sorts out his technology. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Thanks, uh, Padma, and uh, good evening, Pan. Uh, I'm happy to be part of this uh, panel discussion. In fact, all of us uh, have been trying to, and in fact, even today, are trying to respond to the immediate need to continue our ongoing research work within the given constraints. And uh, some of us have uh, become quite comfortable using the available digital tools and are likely to continue using them beyond the pandemic given the potential uh, that they hold as well as the prevalence. Uh, and since several of us were already familiar with the use of some of the digital tools of social science research even before COVID hit us, I think thankfully we have not been uh, left completely at loss. Um, and much of what I will uh, share today is based on my experience of using uh, technology and digital tools during my stint with Connected Learning Initiative, Clicks, at TISS. And uh, more recent experiences of conducting research remotely. Uh, uh, I request Poonam to please, or Ekta to please share uh, the slide. 
So although I have uh, divided my remarks into uh, three buckets, as suggested by the organizers, I must say that uh, these uh, three themes um, are actually uh, related to and run across the data life cycle. Um, in fact, uh, you can see the data life cycle on the left side of the screen and um, the methodological concerns, the use of technology and ethical considerations, in fact, play a role during planning what data we collect, the process of collecting data or acquiring it if it is uh, from secondary sources, the process of storing and preparing it for analysis, the actual analysis of the data, and finally reporting the key findings. So methodological concerns, technological concerns, as well as ethical concerns really run across these uh, the entire uh, life cycle. And researchers, uh, we as researchers, we have to pay actually attention to uh, these things throughout the data cycle. So let me quickly take a look at um, uh, these three themes, and I'll try to illustrate it with some of the examples uh, from what uh, we have experienced uh, during clicks, as well as my more recent work. Uh, starting with methodology, and here I want to actually start by saying that as researchers, we should try to explore as much as possible to use existing uh, open data sets in our research, as much as our research questions allow us to use these. I recently used uh, the Indigo data set of the Geo Lab, uh, University of Oxford, as part of a hack and learn event that we were doing to understand the social network analysis of the impact bonds uh, across the world. And this data set is available uh, in open uh, uh, domain and we can uh, researchers are free to use it. But while using, and there are several such data sets available uh, World Bank uh, and UNDP and so on, including Government of India, so on. Now, the only thing I wanted to caution here is when we use existing data sets, it's important uh, to make sure that the format of these is appropriate for our analysis. Otherwise, we spend also have to spend a lot of time working on the formatting of the data uh, to meet data set to meet our requirements. Also, make sure that this data is of good quality. It is complete. It is reliable. And it's also important to understand the context within which this is collected because uh, very often when we collect primary data, we, we understand the context within which we are collecting that data. But somehow when we use open data sets, there seems to be a decontextualization of data that takes place. And it's important that we try to also understand the context to uh, better understand the data that we are using if we are using an open data set. In terms of the tools, I think, uh, a lot of times uh, uh, people think that qualitative data collection is uh, a bit of a challenge in uh, when when we try to use technology and that is true uh, uh, you know collection of images collection of um, observations uh, uh, you know observations via uh, 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 some kind of a zoom call in the classroom say suppose there is a zoom call happening in the classroom and if you are allowed to go in there and observe or um, recording of audio data video data these end up being quite heavy as files and i think that is one of the bigger challenges apart from also using this uh, innovatively is uh, uh, can be a challenge but it is a, a definitely a possibility more commonly used are actually the surveys and interview tools and if you have online tools that can do that the limitation really of this is uh, in what i find is although they are easy to use uh, and you know you don't really need special coding skills to do that you you end up having to very often use very short and structured items. So if that's the nature of your study, I think surveys uh, are, are really great tools. And interviews also can be collected. I, in fact, conducted a series of interviews for an innovative financing project that we just completed. And uh, th that also has its own uh, potential in terms of maintaining the data, going back to the transcripts, and allowing it to be used qualitatively. Uh, in terms of uh, importance and, uh, of data management, I cannot really stress enough because it's important to maintain metadata of the data that we are gathering, who is collecting it, what is the format, what is the size uh, of data that we are gathering. Um, 
Also, uh, this is a challenging task, uh, may not be as much for research scholars, uh, MPhil PhD students, but when one is running large research projects, because it's important to make sure that the folders are organized properly, that data is stored, there's backups, who has access to data and so on. So data management itself requires serious attention. Um, especially when uh, the data that is collected is also in a digital format. And uh, finally, data in integrity. And here, uh, actually, I wanted to say uh, uh, in terms of transcription errors that uh, uh, one very often finds, you, you do have these uh, tools which do audio to text conversions and they cost less. And we may go back to using these in order to save costs, but there could be very often transcription errors. And even when you get transcriptions done of interviews, like I did for the interviews that I did uh, on innovative financing, we, we got the transcriptions, uh, but then we had to go through it. We had to send it back to the respondents to make sure that they, uh, they, are, they approve it. Um, there is also a, a possibility of inadvertently manipulating data or rather the data getting modified when there are several people who are handling that data and there needs to be uh, uh, at most care taken in order to make sure that that doesn't happen. And it's important to also make sure, make sure that we use a particular tool consistently throughout the life cycle. So you start, for example, using an online tool and then let's say, for example, the schools open and you're having, you get access to the teachers. It's important to make sure that you don't abandon the online tool and go back to doing face-to-face -face interviews using the same questions because then the, the, you're not consistently using the tool. You could use additional questions to probe in through in-person, but it's important to maintain consistency of the tool and not change it midway. Um, in terms of technology, I think the key part, uh, the key challenge is data storage. Apart from the qualitative uh, heavy files that I mentioned, there are also, uh, it's important to make sure, make sure that uh, we physically safeguard data. And this, uh, this relates to things like even pen drives getting misplaced or laptops uh, getting, uh, you know, uh, corrupted or hacked or dropping coffee over the laptop and so on. So, one has to make sure that if the data is available on a person's laptop, that we make sure that we take adequate physical safeguards. Um, if data is stored on the cloud, it's important to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, where it's going to be residing, off whether if it's residing offshore, what is permissible, what is not permissible. And um, uh, there's import it's also important to make sure that if it is uh, available on a person's laptop, that it is security protected, password protected. There is adequate backups uh, that are taken uh, from time to time. Uh, people who can access that data are restricted and not everybody has. And it's also important to make sure that we minimize transfers and copying of data sets because, or, or data because that can really create issues uh, with regards to corrupting data or data getting lost or changing in formats. So I would suggest minimizing uh, transfers and copying and let one person handle the data and it be available and accessible to a select people. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the ethical concerns, and here I must say that TISS has a robust system in place for ethical clearances, the Institute Institution uh, uh, Research uh, Review Board, IRB, and most of the uh, researchers would have gone through uh, the IRB. But it's important, I want to stress here to uh, make sure that uh, the uh, respondents are given complete information in the language that they can understand, and we seek informed consent. Uh, or assent if uh, depending on uh, who is uh, the respondent and uh, parental consent is essential uh, children adolescents very often also are required to give their assent uh, because they cannot although they cannot legally decide uh, whether to pay a part or not and there have to be opportunities for them to withdraw from a particular research or withhold information if they choose to. And uh, as, as something which Eric also mentioned earlier, it's important to ensure that we collect lean data, we collect minimal data, especially of personally identifiable data. Uh, because Just because you have access to people, uh, it's important to make sure that you do not go overboard and collect only minimally what is required. Um, it's important to also uh, look at anonymizing data. 
and this is uh, this can be done by several ways and we can get into that if we need to do question answers but it's uh, important to make sure that individuals are not exposed their personal data is not exposed but at the same time make sure that even sensitive patterns of data are not exposed and uh, uh, that can be discriminatory and all safeguards need to also be mentioned taken especially when we are talking about children because uh, in terms of uh, the language that we use uh, also being flexible about the time we need to give a lot more time if we are uh, looking at children if you are using an online uh, medium to interact with children there is a need to also have a presence of another adult or not interact with one child at a time there should at least be two children maybe consider presence of a teacher or a, or a parent if that is not too too intrusive and uh, since time is short i'll be quite happy to take question answers but to quickly summarize i think while uh, the potential of the using digital tools during this pandemic should be fully explored i also think it's important to recognize the limitations it places on some form of research work and i think it's important to ask whether use of digital tools is a good fit and if it is not a fit i think it's uh, important that we are patient and wait for things to come back to normalcy and select the methodology and technology that is more organic to the research questions being explored so i'll stop here and over to you padma but i look forward to questions and answers thank you thanks thanks archana uh... I think you. Um, I just wanted to recall uh, a point that uh, Eric made, and then observe, uh, uh, just note a couple of things that you have said. I think Eric, uh, it was really interesting that you presented uh, to us two cases, and how the the changed situation has actually enabled two very different things to happen in those two researches. I thought that's really important, and the willingness to settle for less. because we can really can't have more in the case of the early, the early literacy coaching context i think that's really a valuable observation that you've pointed us to and that even lean data can tell us a lot and within the research community we would respect what we learn from such data as much as we would from this opportunity to look at everything so i think that is a really important point as well as this possibility of a lot more data coming in from the the revised context of ai learning and teachers so thank you for that uh, archana i think uh, i was just uh, thinking about what you said and uh, the question of maintaining data anonymizing it and handling data i think very often it's true that as researchers we miss uh, we don't pay enough attention to these things we just treat them like logistics as if they will handle themselves and they're not worthy of uh, researchers attention and i think definitely in your own work that's something that has come up for very serious planning isn't it and management i'm also getting this idea from both your observations that uh, we we don't have an opportunity to be very spontaneous in these contexts so the, the more planning that happens before anticipating uh, enables us to carry forward the research more robustly so i think that is probably something that's coming up isn't it stepping back and actually investing time and in thinking through things a lot more than we would have if we had opportunity to keep returning to the field with revised it in a more iterative way yeah thank you um we'll move on to uh, don pasi now don we great to hear from you on your experiences and uh, suggestions on possibilities Okay. Um thank you very much Padma and um thank you to all for um for this invitation and I'm very uh, happy to to join the panel and to offer some thoughts but also to hear about um other thoughts and experiences. Um just to give you a little bit about uh, my background. Um I'm a professor in a UK university at Lancaster. my field is technology enhanced learning but my background is very much in the learning area so i'm interested in how technology um affects learning uh, either positively or negatively um i direct uh, a doctoral program within my department uh, which is a doctoral program which is pretty much run online so i'm very used to the online environment and uh, for me it's absolutely essential 
And within that program, we we have about a hundred doctoral students who are working with us at at, at any one point in time. Um, and the only way that we can do that is basically via technology. So I'm used to using technology and many of the students who are on that program would use uh, technologies for uh, data collection. They would use them for investigations. Um, so I can draw upon those experiences as well as my own. I think one of the things that I would like to say is I think with regard to research and ethics and this sort of direction, we should be guided where the possible future is. You know, I think that with regard to thinking about research and regard to thinking about the ethics involved, for me, a very important question is where is the possible future going to be? You know, we, we know that within this pandemic situation, we have um, we've found that this has come quite suddenly but on the other hand there is a lot of discussion about how long that might persist and actually whether things will get back to what would have been regarded as a norm what would have been regarded as the thing that was happening before and whether we are going to be in a different situation so for me i think one of the fundamental questions is how is our possible future guiding us on this? What are we thinking about in terms of what our research is doing and the ethics concerned with that? Are we going to be more reliant upon the online medium in the future? And does that make a difference to where we should be positioning ourselves in terms of our research and our, our ethics involved? Although we work uh, in education and in research with, with different groups of people, um, and you've highlighted through this the, the groups, teachers, children, school administrators and parents. I do think, and it, this echoes what has already been said, I think, that we need to think about what the technology can do in terms of positively supporting us. And for me, there are two fundamental things that the technology does. The first is that it gives a voice. So one of the really important things about technology within this pandemic has been the fact that the technology has opened up communications in so many ways. And it's opened up communications in terms of research. And actually, I think that that's very, very important that, that many, many people want to give a voice through research. They want to give their ideas, in my experience. And the technology actually helps us to do that. It provides us with that sort of voice. Whether we're giving them a voice in terms of observing practice, whether we're, whether we're doing that through interviews, whether we're doing that in terms of, of recollections, whether we're working online with them, it's enabling them to give a voice to, to us through that research. And it allows engagement. And we know that some of the things that are happening with regard to this pandemic are that increasingly some people are feeling isolated. They actually want to be engaged. And research is one area where we can help to engage people. So for me, research has that, if you like, ethical basis behind it of being able to, to provide a voice, but also to provide engagement. And I, I think that that is, is as important in terms of ethical thinking as it is in terms of research practice. I think that I think that you know um, the, the previous speakers have gone over a lot of ethical considerations, and I don't want to to go over those again. But certainly, if one is recording through um, through an online medium, there are ethical considerations that one has to give with regard to that. So recording agreement is a little bit different from um, uh, agreement if you're doing a face-to-face -face interview. And even if you're doing it through an, an audio record, if you're doing a video record, that does make a difference because you've got the visibility of someone and that, that makes a big difference. So it makes a difference in terms of who has access to that, those data and things like the retention time, how long one is going to hold it and where one is going to hold it securely. Um, so I think that those are, are important considerations. I would say 
that for me, one of the things to bear in mind with regard to this pandemic and with regard to thinking about one's research and what one might do in terms of the current situation and the ethical considerations involved is to think through the whole research study, to think through the whole set of elements of that study and what that means, rather than focusing just on one area. Yes, of course, the methodology is important, but it's one area of the research. Yes, the ethics are important, but again, it's another area. So for me, there are there are seven fundamental areas that, that one needs to think about with, with, with regard to one's research and how that fits with the current sorts of situation. The first is the research problem. How does the research problem that you're trying to look at fit with the current situation or a future consideration? How, how is that manageable? And the second is the time frame. And what we know is that, that the online actually does affect time frame, because with an online environment, you cannot necessarily maintain engagement in the same way and to the same extent. Often you need to use different techniques, for example, with regard to interviewing, uh, with regard to working with people online. And the time element and the time frame is very important. So that, that is something to consider. The study topic itself, how does, that, how does that fit in terms of the current situation and how feasible is it? How viable is it? And then the fourth would be the methodological approach. And there, it's it's a matter of, is the methodological approach appropriate? Can it actually be done? Or does one need to rethink that? And, and both of the, the, the previous speakers have mentioned that. And then the data collection methods. But as I've said, for me, the two important things there are to enable this giving of voice and to the enabling of engagement. Those, for me, are very fundamental. And then the sixth item would be reliability and validity. And there is a question about reliability and validity. So even now, asking people to recollect things previously tends to be a little bit different from how it was prior to the pandemic, because memory is being affected by these sorts of situations. And often it brings together ideas that come out within a shorter period of time rather than on a long, longer period of time. So reliability and validity are things that one has to bear in mind with regard to what questions one is asking and, and what sort of data one is gathering. And then the last one would be the ethics and what, what, what one should be thinking of with regard to ethics. Even things like social distancing, for example, what that means in terms of how one can work with people. Uh, that might be within an um, within a room within an institution, but also what that means in terms of gathering the data, which might be in video format, uh, which might be observational, which can be set up, of course, but then it's a question of, of how to handle it. And the uh, extent of that video capture is is uh, very, very important. And it does mean that the systems that one has in place uh, need to be very carefully thought through in terms of what the possibilities are um, and the extent to which that might be possible or, or it might not be possible. I think in terms of the digital divide, again, I would, I, I would sort of um, come forward with this idea of giving voice as far as is possible. I think it's very important in terms of the digital divide because it, there are benefits to that in terms of representation in terms of representativeness, but also enabling people to put their voice into a wider picture. How one can gather that in terms of the visual or the audio, of course, is important. And with many people having forms of mobile access, then clearly that is something that can be possible. It might be possible as long as one is able to, to, to actually use and understand the limitations that people might have with regard to their mobiles or, or, or smartphone access. And whether it's possible to do certain things offline, for example, and whether then they can be later uploaded so that it's not always necessary to do everything um, online, but whether it's possible to do things offline and whether it's possible to do that through sharing, 
whether that can be done through communities, etc. Et but also then, how are how valid are those data going to be outside of the context of a pandemic like ours? So there is also this question again of is is the future actually pushing us in a direction that's going to be useful here? What data should we be gathering in order to inform us not only about what's happening within the pandemic, but also about what's going to go on beyond and what the different sorts of contexts might be in the beyond? So that's really um, what I wanted to, to, to cover in, in, in outline. I've been um, a bit provocative within that, I think, but um, I hope that that might sort of stimulate some questions and thoughts. So thank you. Thank you for that. <coughs> thank you, Don. I think some of the things that you mentioned really struck me as important, the way in which uh, the, the experience of time and how we engage and the assumptions that we make about time, how that has shifted when we begin to use technology and becoming much more alert to that, I think was a very important point. Uh, also, I think this point about uh, the, uh, the pandemic has certainly made us all look at technology interfacing and its presence in our lives much more seriously for consideration. And I think that's an important uh, point that you raised that we should also not only be looking at what it's doing today, but also how it's likely to affect social reality going forward now that there's a certain greater presence of technology and its use in our lives. So certainly I think as researchers, many of our students might want to return to looking at whether their research problem can have this more forward look as well um, on the kinds of things that are likely to come up. As you were speaking, I was wondering about the whole problem of accessing informants that uh, students are likely to face. How do we access a stranger in this time? How do we even reach out uh, in a school uh, or to students? How do we get and enroll people to become participants in our research? I think that's really going to challenge many of us. We've no idea how we're going to just, we can't just be wildly sending out blind emails and phone calls expecting somebody will answer. In, so how do we identify our research populations that gain access to them uh, and build trust, which a researcher needs, I think are also going to be issues that students are going to face. And uh, I hope that going forward, some of you may be a scene, Yusuf, you'll have something to say. And then I'm hoping panelists will come back and reflect on some of these issues as well. Uh, second, uh, uh, I'm very thankful to the center and the uh, and Poonam and Professor Sarangpani to invite me to this particular uh, very interesting and thought provoking deliberations. Uh, when I got the invitation, I was not sure that why should do I know anything to speak on it? Uh, do I have enough uh, anything to say on it? Uh, and that's why I took some time to respond also. And then what I thought that I'm very new to give my brief background, I'm new to this uh, medium of interaction, which is electronic. So I was, I'm quite technologically friendly, so I've adapted it very quickly. Uh, uh, and I'm one of those people who just love going to the field and sitting on the field for the months together and understanding the situation. And within that, I we had this pandemic and uh, we were pushed and our school was pushed by our students and alumni to do something. And that's where we started doing field work. So what I can do today, I will not be that. I might be very theoretically pedestrian and very uh, uh, simple articulation of what I'm going to say is that the, the experience which we had in the last five, six months, we we done a series of studies, mostly through online media. And uh, there, there's never been a face-to-face -face interaction, it's all online. So I'm just going to share those experiences uh, with you and hopefully it may make sense and uh, and I will try to draw from there certain conceptual uh, uh, conclusions but as I say that uh, it may be very pedestrian in nature. So uh, just quickly start with is uh, uh, we, what we thought uh, was that uh, uh, when we start doing research and looking for starting data uh, on whom to, uh, how, what is the nature of the data? We found two kind of uh, uh, classifications there. One was the research researcher-directed 
uh, uh, collection of data and one which you can mine the digital space. The, uh, the researcher director data included live interviews on various platforms ranging from WhatsApp to Zoom to Jitsi to Google Chat. Uh, then we had we uh, we administer many of the interviews, uh, a survey uh, which were which were which were of the nature of survey or through basically Google Forms and similar other platforms. The second uh, genre of data collection was. Uh, which we call mining the digital spaces, which were largely pertaining to the visuals and descriptions which appears on YouTube, uh, Twitter, and so on and so forth, and various other uh, platforms. Then there are series of videos which are available on, uh, on the issues which we're trying to research, which we can loosely term it as a citizen journalism. And the third was the data sets, which were both available from the government as well as the non-government sources. Now, the difficulty which we found as a researcher, as I explained that for me, going to the field was research. Uh, uh, that here was an, here was an understanding, here, uh, here was something which has collapsed three things. The research arena, which we generally consider the wider thematic area where we want to do research, which we try to explore first what is written and not written there. Uh, the second was the research instruments. Uh, uh, which uh, we, in this circumstances, we thought about it, all the technological equipment, te applications, not equipments, applications like right from Zoom, Jitsi and so on and so forth. And the third was a research site. And the research site was basically when we are interviewing somebody uh, or we are accessing some digital information in order to research. So what happened to us that all these three collapsed together. Uh, and when these three things collapsed together, Analytically, they might be very different to each other, but we were using the same instrument to do all the, all the three things, and which had some kind of, uh, which I might say, some kind of uh, issue while we, uh, in terms of uh, 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 challenges which emerge and certain ethical consideration from, from it. So let me first give you two case studies quickly. I'll try to be very brief. Uh, uh, when we started studying the local state, how does the local state response? And this is directly in response to what Padma Sarangpani raised in the, in the end towards that, how do they access the field? Uh, so uh, uh, when we started, so the uh, our, uh, uh, in India, we call the office of the district magistrate, which is the executive head of a district. So we started approaching various district magistrates to give us some appointment either on the phone or on the email or, or on, on some kind of video platform. Now, what we learned quickly that there was absolutely not a possibility to get an appointment through the merit of the research. Uh, second, that if you if I want to execute a survey or a questionnaire, we have limited autonomy because that survey or questionnaire has to be vetted by the office, the officials. And before we can go and ask, start asking questions to their subordinates. Uh, and this primarily came up when we were doing the frontline study for the ICDS workers and the police personals, uh, frontline workers. So every, each and every questionnaire were first vetted by the officials before it could be passed on. Third, that these questionnaires were not executed by us. These questionnaires, the link was given to us and what is executed by the office itself. Now, when we reach to the uh, 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 actual interviewers, so uh, interviewees where we get uh, respondents who we are trying to interview. So there, there was all the procedure which ethics tell us, uh, share with us of informed consent and permission for prospective sharing of the data and all. We did all those things, but the remarkably and unfortunately, I would say, because the way the question was administered, we perform a remarkable uniformity in a response as if the questionnaire was filled by one person itself. Though it is, it technology is not possible in reality because it was a Google form. So somebody has to log on to their Google uh, account to fill the form. So, uh, so there was an absolute remarkability in the responses. Uh, and uh, the second thing that whom we can get the form filled was also decided by the officials. It was not that we were deciding. Neither were we were able to make a scientific sample that how do we approach officials. Uh, now, as a result, what happened? That normally when we do research on policy, I come from a school of policy background, I do research on policy, that we try to capture the process 
where we are able to capture the various nodes of implementation and the bottlenecks therein, whether it's an informal, formal design problem, social structure problem, so on and so forth, we are able to capture. But in the process which we did this, we were not able to capture that node. And second, the scientific, there was not a scientifically drawn sample because the questionnaire was not distributed as our, as we would have wanted to do. It was decided by the office of the district magistrate who will fill the questionnaire or the commission of police that who will fill the questionnaire. Okay, now let's come to the second case study, which I quickly want to, uh, I'll quickly present before you, is that when we started in the pandemics, I, for people who are not from India, I, I will just briefly quickly say that when the lockdown came, uh, was announced, there was a massive reverse migration of, in the, of the people who were working in the informal sector in the big urban centers, and they wanted to go back to the cities. So there were a massive reverse migration, which for, for some time by, was by foot, and then, it, then the more formal means of train and buses came in. So there was a massive reverse migration. So what we were trying to interview was these people who are going back from the urban centers to this. Uh, now, the first thing was that it was utmost difficulty to procure the numbers. Eventually, we managed to get the numbers to various civil society organizations and uh, 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 the office of this, uh, district magistrate, police commissioner, health service officers and all. But uh, the problem which we faced was most of the numbers were not correct. The phone instrument may be not, be, there may be one particular instrument being shared by the whole family. So you may have to call several times to just uh, to, uh, to meet the person or when the male of the family or the head of the family had to get an explicit permission so that they can speak to us on the phone. Uh, uh, here the consent procedure was very ambiguous. What I mean to say that the consent procedure was ambiguous is that even when the person says yes, the level of trust was so low that it was difficult to ask them to or difficult to get, share, get the information shared. They were not willing to share the information beyond something because the moment you tell them that we are recording this or is your consent there to record this? Because there, there are ethical norms. Uh, now, the moment the level of trust was so low because some unknown fear. And it was third is that it was absolutely impossible on time for us to verify the age. If, if, we are trying, if we are saying that we want to speak to a younger person or a child or, 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 or adolescent, no, not adolescent, or children or, or, or people between 5 to 15. So, uh, so it was absolutely impossible to verify the age. Uh, now, the second problem was that because these were the, and many of the interviews were conducted in the, uh, in the centers where the migrants were housed so that they don't take the, uh, if they, they were affected by the coronavirus, they don't they take it back to the villages. So it was a shifting population. So it was almost impossible for us for to go back to the same uh, participant, the same respondent again and again. So there was no time for icebreaker. Uh, uh, now, uh, the, the another issue which came up was uh, even uh, the ethical, the, the most important point which I'm trying to push to, uh, to, to uh, put, put it in front for your consideration is that being on the telephone, being on, the, and many times we were able to also activate a Zoom or, uh, or, or uh, 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 video calls through the through the local administration, the local civil society organization, we were not in a position to understand the emotional stress which we might be putting them under, uh, uh, we might be, they, they might be undergoing when we are asking certain questions. Second, that we were also not sure whether we are, uh, uh, they are at a discomfort to answer the question because of the possibility of certain state officials around them, because they have passed on the uh, instrument of uh, uh, research instruments that that is the uh, the the phone or the uh, laptop or the video through which they were, uh, we were accessing. Uh, so level of trust was so. Uh, the level of trust. I'll take. Two, three, can I take two three minutes more, Professor Parma? Actually, one minute more. <laughs> okay. Uh, the level of trust. I quickly wind up. The level of trust was so low that when we eventually reached to a point that we were interviewing directly in their homes, the outs, around five to six out of 10 used to say no, uh, that they don't want to uh, give this interview. So quickly, I'll, 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 I'll stop this uh, and then I will quickly conclude by saying that when we see the 
are we uh, intrusive in nature? That, that's the question. Which we, we, are we intrusive in nature? So is, is their participation was passive or active? So what we understood that, see, building trust was so difficult and it takes much of a time. So it takes two, three calls for ice breaking, then sharing about ourselves. What we learned from it, that was sharing about ourselves, our family, our condition was very important to first get their trust followed by is my uh, followed by is that is that from the third or fourth interaction they started opening so that was very important when we started sharing about our life conditions second is that uh, uh, this the potential harm which we are not able to understand in the initial period is about the emotional distress or if are they, we are putting them under certain certain kind of threat of loss of welfare goods if they say something negative against the local government and so so this this was the the, the, the procedure we followed we took at least one family 15 days to 20 days to understand them and to continuously call them many a times they never used to talk to us also but this was a procedure which eventually clicked and that's how their vulnerability and potential harm was quite substantially reduced. And we were able to grasp, uh, the, uh, we were able to get certain facts, certain narratives, which were quite useful to our research. The last point which I want to say is about the state processes which, help, which can help us to capture the policy processes, which were almost blank until and unless we were able to get in touch with the retired officials. Who were able to connect these dots for us? So I end here. Thank you so much. I'm sorry if I have delayed the session. No, no. Thank you, Asim. I think it's very rich because you actually carried out research during this pandemic period, uh, and I think you, what you're saying is echoing some of the experiences we've also had in trying to administer an online tool to teachers and others, well aware of uh, the how much much more ob obliged we are to the time that respondents give to us uh, in enabling us to understand their context and condition. I think, and in, in a way, as we often experience with technology, even in pedagogy, uh, we become much more aware of uh, ourselves as well. And a lot of the tacit uh, context in which communication takes place, it makes it explicit. And, uh, and that's something which we have to learn to work with in using technology. So thank you very much. I think those were really rich uh, descriptions for us to think about. Uh, I'm going to ask Yusuf to come in now with your thoughts. Uh, and I just want to just uh, uh, suggest to the panelists that I thought that while we wait for our audience to give us questions, after Yusuf has spoken, I'd like to give you all two minutes to just respond to each other first, and then we'll pick up the questions from the, uh, the audience and the participants of this webinar. So do... Uh, Organize your own thoughts if you want to respond to what other panelists have said already. Yusuf, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, yes. All right, thank you for the invitation. It's good to talk to you about this topic. It's also nice to come last, so I won't repeat what all the other panelists have said practically about how you deal with online. I'm going to make uh, five points. They're slightly different but then attempt to reflect on the questions and the dilemmas posed in the, in the five research questions. But let me start with one making a remark, which I think is important about the pandemic and the COVID pandemic. There is a strong thesis and approach that the pandemic has created such an exceptional situation and scenario, and that therefore we need to find alternative ways of doing things and primarily the internet uh, and technology of the computer is the way we teach and learn and the way we do research. And that theory of exceptionalism, exceptionalism as I call it, goes so far as to suggest in some cases, and I think it's a point that some of the speakers made, that somehow other established principles of research no longer apply in the same way. Let me put it very clearly. I mean, Ethical implications are the same way of working with children, whether you do it online or face to face. Informed consent, do no harm, and ensuring that you have an obligation to report any untowards information that you pick up, you know, abuse or anything, 
applies whether you do it through an online medium or any other way with children. And there also is the ethical obligation, whether you do it online or face-to-face, -face, of ensuring that you have informed consent of both the parent, guardian, caregiver, as well as the child, because the children you are talking to in the example you've given have some information and understanding of what they can what they're talking about. So I guess that's my first point, that while the pandemic does shape and reshape and extend to how, uh, to how we do research, philosophically speaking, the principles of good research in a sense still remains, whether it's about the seven things that Don sp spoke about or the practical things that others have spoken about. So I think that's the first point. Second point is to just unpack a bit uh, what we've been talking about technology and as a response to partly and picking up on all the other presenters, the discussion of technology so far has reduced it largely to internet and computers. So it's been about Zoom or WebEx or teams or other things, but the reality is that the UNESCO survey tells us that the most common technology that was used and still used in the pa pandemic by many people, and I'm talking now not about research and teaching and learning, has been primarily the radio and printed materials. The, the inequity is that the gap spread and extent of technology is not as widespread as we think computer technology, and even where it's available, the cost of data utilization is much more expensive than we make it out to be. So in that sense, what that tells us that if you're thinking about how the techniques of research uh, in the current pandemic, you've got to un unpack what you mean by technology and think about a wider range of technologies, including print base and radio, for example, in some research that we did in Somalia, the technology that worked the best was to give kids a piece of paper and a pen to draw a picture. And that worked as of the ideal as much as any other way. The second thing about the technologies and what we mean by it, a lot of qualitative research that we've been used to up to now has the presumptions of presence, immediacy, and synchronicity. In other words, to understand research and to conduct research, we have to be there, we have to be present, and we have to understand it. That's been the biggest challenge most researchers have faced in the pandemic. It's that first principle and presumption of research, particularly qualitative research that we've all been taught. How do you do it in the pandemic? Well, there are ways around it practically to think about and consider low-tech, asynchronous means of research. For example, asking kids, you know, in, a, in another study we did, we simply dropped off cameras at a point in the school where kids could access it because we're trying to look at the school environment. Ask kids to take photographs and then we collect the cameras at the later point and process the picture and do a visual image. The same thing with the drawing example I gave. Where online synchronous um, uh, research does work, it's particularly when you're talking about policy elites and policy makers who have access. So if you're interviewing uh, school heads or policy makers in government departments, like we did an interview this morning with uh, the presidents of a teacher union and a ministry official, you can do it synchronously and online because it works, because they have the means, they have the tools, and they have the uh, repertoires to engage with you in the medium you choose. But one needs to be careful about how the medium does not end up becoming the message, because in a sense, part of how you ask the questions and how you frame it in a face-to-face -face encounter, and what you can see in a face-to-face -face encounter as opposed to the limitations of online becomes important. The third point I want to make is obviously building on the argument I've made about inequities in access around technologies such as computers. But there are other inequities that one needs to talk about in research, whether it's online or otherwise, 
The inequities are also about how you ask the question, how you frame the question, whether you did online or by face to face. You can be exclusionary in the ways you ask the questions. You can be exclusionary in the languages of communication you use. You can be exclusionary in the kind of methods you use for, for answering some of the things. And I can go and give you examples about that and how we dealt with it. But one way we did try to deal with that, for example, in Somalia, uh, where what we did drawing on the first point about immediate, immediacy synchronicity, where we felt that we couldn't rely on online, the online means to do the interview, we created safe zones outside the school and outside the homes in a socially distanced way for the parents to arrive at and in which the researchers will be present to talk uh, in a real-time way, but socially distanced. We created a safe way and that cost a bit of technology and money. The fourth point I want to make is that an obvious one, while a lot of the questions that were posed, which are really good, assume that you want to keep to the questions you're asking. In other words, you want to see how you deal with the pandemic and how it impacts your current topic, is to flip that on its head and ask where the pandemic itself becomes the object of analysis and not a hindrance to the object of analysis. In other words, clearly one of the important research questions right now is what has been the differences in learning uh, for kids who've been under extended periods of lockdown? What has been the role of home? How has home, home made a difference in learning? I mean, the limited research in South Africa or Somalia simply tells us that poorer parents and poorer schools and, and if you like, uh, resource scarce homes don't benefit in the same way as richer homes do during the pandemic. And therefore the school becomes an important site. And opening the school becomes as much a question about pedagogy as it becomes about equitable access to learning. I guess the fifth point and to end, uh, be, the, the first point to make, and then I'll draw it together, is to the, that not all of the things are possible technology, no matter how much you overcome some of the limitations. If you really want to understand pedagogy and how it's enacted in real time in the classroom, then I think as one of the panelists pointed out, you just have to wait. You can't do it as easily in the lockdown as you think, no matter how much you choose either synchronous online tools or asynchronous, because some things about pedagogy requires the immediacy of immersion and the immediacy of understanding and viewing. And I think some technology, and this is, I think, I hope you come back to me in the question time of that. So I guess my fundamental takeaways from the notes I've written out down on ha in hand rather than PowerPoint is to argue that one needs to think about the pandemic and its impact on research in different ways. One is it fundamentally keeps uh, some of the principles of good research do not disappear, although they may shift and alter. Secondly, to think about research in ways that don't require necessarily immediacy, presence, and synchronicity, and to think about making the pandemic itself an object of research in the context of the huge inequity impacts of the pandemic. Thank you. That is a, you summarized what you had pointed out. So thank you. I think you've drawn attention to some new issues that uh, other panelists hadn't referred to, um, and also turning the pandemic itself into an object of inquiry, uh, I think is a useful way of, so you factor it into your research questions and not uh, keep it out there as if it's just one, a background, just one, a background. issue. Um, I'm going to actually now quickly give the panelists an opportunity to speak to each other, but very briefly, please just take one minute, maybe two minutes. Uh, and there are some important questions that have come up in the chat box in the meantime. Uh, I'll relay them back to you. Uh, but let's just go with this first. Um, so can we start? Eric, would you like to go first? Your responses, having heard the other panelists as well. I'll just point out, I think, a couple themes that, that I see and some things I draw away. Uh, one is that I think in many ways the, the pandemic 
um, while it's created some problems, it's really just shined a light on other problems. So like things like inequality and and the sort of different experience that people have access to technologies, et cetera. It didn't necessarily create those, but it sort of shined a brighter light on those. Um, and I think coming away from that, um, uh, we, we also need to understand that uh, even hopefully when, when things are much better from a health perspective in the coming months, um, or, or year, uh, you know, a lot of these things will stay. So some of the things will remain that, that happened before that we just shone a light on. Other things that have changed our practices, um, those things will stay uh, for a longer period of time. And I think um, what we need to do is now adjust not for not for just the next coming months, but for um, for the next wave of research and and innovation and um, and change that we all want to make. Thank you. Yeah, Arjuna. Yeah, I will just go quickly with the question of uh, rapo building, and I think uh, this is really very critical because uh, uh, the respondents not only, uh, or rather, the researchers not only have to uh, make sure that uh, they build trust, uh, but they also make sure that there are uh, there is a trust built about the medium which is being used to communicate with the respondents. And uh, that really requires patience, and I would think uh, uh, perceptiveness on part of respondents. Make sure they give enough time, and this also relates to one of the comments that has come in the chat box in terms of not overburdening the respondents at this time, being respectful of their pressures and burdens at this point of time, and not being uh, pushy about uh, really trying to get our research work done. And I think that is really the key because. Uh, while our research happens, people's lives are also uh, consuming them. The second point I very quickly want to make is about uh, uh, sampling. And this is not uh, becomes particularly acute in the context of doing work online. But some of the questions about locating the representative uh, sample and so on really also apply to contexts where uh, we are not trying to work in this way. So I'll stop it at that and come back to some of the questions later. Thanks, uh, Don. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Padma. Um, I think that the point that I'd like to highlight with regard to technology um, is time, and this is something that has been mentioned. But you know, there is a myth out there that if you use technology, it saves you time. Actually, it is a myth. It can, under certain circumstances, save you time, but in many, many situations, it doesn't. It actually adds to your time. And one of the things in research with technology is you do need to take more time. And the time scale and the time span that need to be involved are different. And that, I think, is a really, really important point to take on board when one's planning research using online technologies. There is more time needed to build up trust. There is more time needed to gain participation, perhaps through snowballing. There is more time that is needed in order to think about the ways that we handle the situation. The time element is fairly crucial. And, it's, and it is a myth to think that just because we're going to use technology, we're going to reduce everything in time terms. We won't. It's it's a very, very important medium because we can gain from it, but there are limitations and we have to give it sufficient time to enable the benefits to come through. That would be the point that I'd like to make. Thanks, thanks, Don. Asim? Asim? I'm not to hear you yet. Yes, now you're audible. Yeah. 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 No, I, what I was saying that I'm, uh, come, I agree with the Don and Arjuna's point about time and trust. But I want to add another bit to it. It's uh, uh, it's about the cultural sensitive sensitivity, uh, because as an outsider, when uh, when we go to the field, it will get absorbed in it over the period of time. And you try to become part of, you can never become local, but you try and become one of those. Uh, you pick up many of the cultural nuances. 
but when you are online it's very difficult to pick up those cultural nuances the dialect of the language the the the, the, the local customs and this especially becomes in projects where you have research investigators so it's because the research investigator is investigator is not living and breathing the research which the pi is doing so so it even becomes more say, more problematic we while doing the past 4 5 months we always felt that when we are drawing on people who have come new to the research it's very difficult to uh, for rapport but the people who are there for a month or two have understood the field is able to relate with the cultural sensitivity are doing much better thank you so much mm -hmm. yes i was thinking that even building a research team and getting that going is challenging under these circumstances you so? so just a brief i want to underscore that point because part of what you lose through online is sociologically speaking and ethnographically speaking you lose understanding of the context you lose understanding of immersing yourself sufficiently in the school context over an extended period of under, of time to understand how the school and exits micro politics the cultural norms it aspires to and the ways it does it work through online you it's hard to bow that up in a very robust and rigorous way and you lose the connection of the school to the immediate community that it's that surrounds it and so you lose that understanding of the school in the context in which it's located and the learners and their interaction to that community and context uh, I'm going to pick up a few questions that have come in the chat and share and share them with our panelists. Um, they're open questions, and I invite you all to uh, reflect and respond. Uh, one of the questions is about how universities are able to support research scholars during this period, and if you have any thoughts or ideas or experiences of how your universities might be supporting people to get over. Many resource scholars don't even have their own laptops, uh, and they're dependent on accessing ICT labs in the university. So it it raises the equity question. But do you have any suggestions on what universities could be doing? The other question is also: Is it okay to provide participants with a data plan so that they can engage with you if they're willing? Uh, would uh, would it be ethical to do? Uh, to take this kind of initiative to compensate people for their time that they give to you for their research or enable them to access technology. So some reflections on that. It's free for all, so please, it's more complicated here. I don't have your gestures, but if any of you'd like to go on these two issues. Uh, I, I can put a few forward please go on, ahead, on, the, on the first one, um, Padma. Yes. Um, I think that I think the most important thing in terms of what the university can do um, is to recognise that the, the the current situation and maybe future scenarios um, change the way in which we need to think about research. That 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 basically that means that the university needs to be comfortable in enabling people to open up that discussion and to take the time with it. One of the things that I hope that we've done within our university is to enable that to happen so that the time pressure is, is not as great as it might be under what would have been regarded as normal circumstances. So it seems to me that, that you know, yes, we can solve things like technological um, issues if we're able to, to, to gain access to certain resources. But the thing that's mo that I feel is important is to, to give people time. It takes time to work things through and to discuss them. It takes time to, to re-plan, to rethink. And that means that you have to have that greater flexibility. And if a university can't provide for that greater flexibility, I think that people suffer. Do you have any suggestions, any of you, on how we can make the sample selection more representative? I mean, how are we going to overcome this uh, problem? Is there any strategy that one could use, approach that might enable us to be confident about 
or respondent selection and the representativeness question. Especially because we don't have access to the wider community. It's really like going in and hitting on specific individuals uh, and selecting them. It's not going to be this organic process that many of us are used to. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if I have the correct answer or not, but I can share what we are doing. Uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, we are uh, studying the uh, reach of the welfare programs in Telangana and Andhra. And uh, uh, since we are, the, we, are, we, are, we are not keen to send any investigators on the field, so we are, we are uh, requesting the local organizations, the village level organizations, okay. uh, to uh, identify the prospective respondents uh, uh, and also give us a lead to them. Okay, so our dependency on those who know the context is clearly, it has yeah. come up. And that's what uh, I think Yusuf said, that we don't yes. know about the context there, yes. Yeah, and then we need to be mediated by somebody who is, yeah. who knows the context and, and can help us. So I think it's, yeah, bring, making more evident our own um, dependencies as researchers in accessing I I wanted to add here uh, something, and uh, this is in the context of the study that we are doing on mainstreaming uh, child laborers, uh, the, sub, the one supported by NHRC. And we are running into similar issues. And what Asim said, we are also trying to get um, inputs uh, and leads uh, on uh, how, to, how do we go about sampling special training centers from child protection societies and uh, UNICEF uh, and other NGOs that are working in this space. Uh, what I just want to stress here, it is important to uh, make sure that we triangulate the sources that lead us to uh, develop a sampling frame, uh, given the fact that uh, sometimes people work in silos and may not be aware of uh, what is happening and we might miss out on certain important uh, uh, constituents uh, that we might have reached out to if we had an opportunity of going there personally. So while that is an extremely valuable way to go about, it's important to triangulate. What is the take here about compensating respondents for time or, or accessing data? Is, is that something that is OK? Yeah. But yes. the work we've done, we've not had a problem with compensating them because, in a sense, the point is, if you like face to face, we would have gone out and collected the data from the respondents, you know, the participants, mm -hmm. minimizing the cost to themselves. In this case, we where we had to, we gave them data plans in order so that okay. we could, if they were available by phone or online. Or in the case of Somalia, what we did, we paid their transport to come to a safe place and mm -hmm. the subsistence for the time that they were away. More so in a context where during the pandemic, many of the communities we research are much poorer, so they have, they don't have access to work at that point, etc. So in that sense, we actually think our research was helpful at that point. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think yes, there are researches in the past as well, even in non-pandemic contexts where people have been compensated for respondents are compensated. I suppose it, it can be considered, but how that is fixed up, what that compensation entails and so on, I'm sure should be deliberated upon uh, by the researcher and their supervisor so that it doesn't alter the process of research, but it facilitates it. Um, there are questions about uh, the problem of handling the data and ensuring that it gets de-identified. And I think the point that Don made earlier, you know, that the fact that we retain data, it's not just anonymity in terms of collecting data and how we report it, but the fact that we become, we have these data repositories uh, as well. So any practices that you recommend or places that researchers can go to, to kind of come up to speed on what uh, should be done, what protocols need to be followed? If anything comes to mind, I'm sure you can share it here. Otherwise, maybe you can share some of these ideas later. Yes, thank you very much, Eric, for being with us. Please run along. We will soon wrap up, so I won't hold all of you to this conversation. Just another five minutes, and then we'll, we'll end. But on this question... Padma, I could offer maybe a comment on that, um, which yes. is... 
I think it's important uh, to have a, a data retention plan. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, one, one should agree. Uh, I mean, as a university, we have an agreement on how long we will retain data and, and what form shared data will be in. So, for example, if, if we're doing video capture, if there are individuals that don't want to have their image shared, then we have to blur them out if we're going to use or share those data further. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think there are practices that one has to put in place uh, in, in order to enable the data to be both retained and to be shared. And I think it's important that uh, institutions under, under, uh, you know, have some form of of data retention plan in, in that respect. Okay, um, any other responses, Archana? Same, Yusuf? I think I'm, I'm going to try to wrap, wrap this up in the next few minutes. So any thoughts you have on the questions that have been asked or in the chat box, please. Um, I just wanted to say here, I put something uh, with regards to role of universities in the chat box, but want to quickly uh, talk about the new areas of research. And uh, this was also uh, referred to by some of the earlier speakers and someone in the uh, chat has also asked about preparation for being professional researchers in this area. So I think uh, what we need to look at is this a situation which has also allowed us to explore new research areas. Uh, some of them have come to light right now, but also newer ways of working and new uh, research opportunities have and uh, new ways of uh, networking with researchers across the globe, new ways of networking with researchers within the country, also looking at new tools of connecting with people who we would have otherwise not connected looking at possibilities of engaging with new sets of respondents. Otherwise, what typically happens is we tend to look at uh, respondents who are just within our uh, reach, physical reach. But now we can possibly think of engaging with respondents and framing research problems, especially for those who are in the earlier stages, beyond our physical reach, because this uh, possibility has opened up. And I think that is also something that uh, we will have to encourage and support uh, research scholars in exploring further. Thanks, yeah. Just to answer one yes. or two of the other questions, I think what's helpful uh, across the universities I've been associated with for research students, the university developed a clear set of guidelines and protocols for research students which I think might help answer quite a lot of the questions in the chat box. The guidelines include extended time. It included access to resources, access to library materials, which or access to seminars, which all get impacted during this mm -hmm. time. And I think it might be useful to just think of a, if you like, a protocol around what the re mm -hmm. entitlements of research students are during the time of this disruptive time, whether it's a pandemic or in future. And I think, for example, some of the guidelines, this is an example now of South Africa, they developed the guidelines where all research students in order to continue at seminars will be given a certain, uh, where they negotiated with the data companies to provide all students who are registered access to online data including mm -hmm. sites of library and usage of data for research purposes. That answers, I think, some of the questions people are asking. Yeah. Thank, thank you. I think that is certainly something that we should be putting into place. And this webinar is, I think, pushing us in that direction to engage with it sooner than later. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from Alok. How can we do activities with student trainees and also what could be the scope of classroom observation? I am not sure how, if I can't answer the second part of the classroom observation, uh, but the first part, FGDs are much more easier and I think they should be the starting point for any such research endeavors. Uh, because mm -hmm. it's a lot of, because when people are in a group, it's easier for them to build the trust and also share with each other. That gives confidence to talk to you also. 
and especially it's a huge huge fun for the children especially those for school going children and they are giving the opportunity to talk to you for half an hour one hour one and a half hours so every day over the period of one week or so it's a huge fun relief for them and their experience comes out after three four days so i would if i would have to do this exercise again i would never start with an individual interview but to go with a group interview first i think that's yeah quite a good point of seeing it i think the presence of a group also enables us to overcome uh the the obviousness of the medium isn't it and a certain organicity of communication it becomes enabled with the group i've also found that to be true with children not only with adults thank you very much thank you i think before i'm going to hand it over to the research scholar community and lakshman specifically to thank you all i want i want to for my own side thank you as well archana asim yusuf don and eric thank you for making time and sharing your experiences and reflections it's i think certainly stimulating me to also engage a lot more with these questions and support our scholars as they navigate the next year at the very least of uh, coping and dealing and responding creatively to what the situation has thrown up thank you lakshman please go ahead hello hello padma can you hear me yes yes perfectly please go ahead yeah so good evening to all uh, i am lakshman a phd student at uh, Uh, Center for Education, Innovation, and Action Research, PIS, Mumbai. I deem it a great honor to me to propose a vote of thanks to all who have helped us in making this panel discussion such a great success. At outset, on behalf of Center for Education, Innovation, and Action Research, PIS, Mumbai, and MPhil and PhD students, I would like to propose hearty vote of thanks to our, our distinguished panelists, Professor Archana Mandale. Center for Education Innovation and Action Research this Mumbai Professor Dan Parsi Department of Educational Research Lancaster UK Professor Asim Prakash School for Public Policy and Governance this Hyderabad Professor Yusuf Said the doctor of the director of the Center for International Teacher Education at Cape Town Peninsula University of Technology South Africa and Professor Eric Cloper director of Scheller Teacher Education Program and the Education Orchid at MIT USA Thank you all for accepting our invite and taking your precious time out and consenting to be panelists for this virtual panel discussion. We are indeed grateful to you all for your very interesting and thought-provoking experiences, insights, suggestions, and recommendations on methodological concerns, technology-based consideration, and ethical considerations that need to be considered for research design when transition our research to an online mode. which will be very helpful for us to go ahead with my re- with our research works i would like to express our profound gratitude to professor padma sarangapani chairperson for center for education innovation and action research this mumbai who readily agreed and accepted our proposal and encouraged for organizing this panel discussion and also helped in identifying the panelists too we also thank professor padma ma'am for gracing today's virtual panel discussion and consenting to be the chair it's my privilege to extend our hearty thanks to professor maithili ramchand who helped us to identify the panelists i am happy to thank ms deepa balerao singh for arranging the platform link communication of event and technology support i would like to express our Uh, gratitude to mr ramesh khade for communication design we would be grateful to all the professors and the research scholars who have joined this virtual panel discussion and your contribution was appreciable my vote of thanks would be incomplete if i don't mention about three names although it is collective effort my co scholars ms poonam maid ms ekta singla and mr alok sharma had played a very significant role in making this panel discussion happen thank you all for being with us thank you ma'am over to you thank you uh, thank you all very much i think this has been a great initiative of the research community at tis and i'm looking forward to this being the first of more such dialogues as we think through and come up with responses i mean we should meet again to review what we have done and what we have learned from the way we are approaching our research questions thank you all very much
Thank you very much, and everyone. Thank you. Thank you to you all of you. Uh, you. Thank you.